If the Radeon 6950 XT is the star straight-A prodigy child, the Radeon 5300 is the maligned middle child whom the parents forgot in the backseat of the car for his own birthday at Chuck E. Cheese. But even so, he still tries his hardest to please his parents by doing his best, even if they don't notice. The Radeon 5300 was released with absolutely no fanfare on August 28th of this year with only a simple web page to celebrate its existence. Based off the RDNA architecture, it's positioned in the market to compete against the NVIDIA GTX 1650, and objectively, it's almost better in every single respect. In fact, it valiantly punches above its weight. And even so, Radeon didn't have the common courtesy to give it a retail release. But unfortunately, it is resigned to being put in pre builts only. You can find them on the used marketplace, and that's how I got this one, and for the $130 price point, it's actually quite good. With 1,408 shaders, 22 compute units, and a core clock of 1,645 MHz, this is just a slower clocked RX 5500 XT with only one major difference. And that is, it comes with only 3GB of GDDR6 with a memory bandwidth of 168GB per second. That is 56GB per second less than the 5500 XT. Other than that, it's basically the same card at a $70 or more discount, or it would be if you could actually buy it on its own. As it stands, pre-builds are where you will find most of these graphics cards. The largest retail you can find them at would be with some Dell gaming desktops. The Radeon 5300 is the default option for the lower price G series and for some Alienware desktops. However, the way that Dell has their PC builder laid out, they have it competing directly up against the 1650 Super. So that is the main graphics card that we will be benchmarking the 5300 against. Although AMD never intended for it to be a direct competitor, as it stands, that's the card that it does compete against. In addition, we will be including the RX 560, as it is the previous generation card that filled the segment in this market and it is still sold in some systems to this day. The last card that we will be comparing the Radeon 5300 to is the GTX 1050, which is the previous generation NVIDIA card that held the spot in this market. The benchmarks and games we will be testing will be Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p maximum settings, Overwatch 1080p maximum settings, Star Wars Squadrons 1080p maximum settings, Squad 1080p high settings, and of course, Minecraft at 1080p maximum settings. We targeted the highest playable settings at 1080p as all of these cards are intended for gaming at this resolution. 4K is out of the question for these lower end cards. Anyhow, enough talk, on to the benchmarks. Shadow of the Tomb Raider played fairly well on this card at these settings. With an average of 37, it is smooth enough most of the time. However, it did drop below V-Sync on occasion to a low of 20 FPS. In some more confined areas of the game, the frame rate climbed past 60 to a maximum of 75. If you wanted optimal performance in this game, it would be a good idea to lower the textures a bit, as the memory bandwidth was the main bottleneck for this card in this game. Compared to the rest of the GPUs tested, it did alright. It obviously performed better than its predecessor, the RX 560, which could barely play the game at these settings. The GTX 1050 didn't fare much better. However, the 1650 Super put on a fantastic show with an almost 60 FPS average. The extra bandwidth this card has helped it achieve a low frame rate that was higher than the average frame rate of the 5300. In this game, the 1650 Super is the clear winner. In Overwatch, the Radeon 5300 got a very playable average of 95, with it only ever dipping down to 72 in the most intense fights. This game runs as smooth as silk and at times would reach beyond the 120 FPS mark. The Radeon 5300 isn't quite capable of running with a 144Hz monitor in this game, but with FreeSync it would be a large step up from any 60Hz monitor. And compared to the rest of the cards tested, the Radeon did pretty well. The 1650 Super expected pulled ahead, however, by not nearly as much as in Tomb Raider. The 560 and 1050 looked decidedly last gen in this particular title, with a maximum of the RX 560 not even reaching the minimum of the Radeon 5300. In Star Wars Squadrons, the 5300 performed quite well with a 102 FPS average. That is more than enough to get smooth, fluid movement in this fast-paced dogfighting game. With it never dropping below 82, screen tearing would not be an issue at all. 
However, when compared to the 1650 Super, it was over 50% slower on average. It may have been a large step up from the 560 and 1050, but against its competition, it is clearly outpaced in this game in almost every respect. Squad is a very demanding large, open-world, first-person shooter that likes a combination of core clocks and VRAM. In this title, the 5300 got an average of 66 FPS, with it never dipping below 39, even when driving with all sorts of explosions going on all around. This card is perfectly capable of playing this game, but beyond 60 FPS V-Sync is a bit ambitious for this card. However, when compared to the 1650 Super, it is again embarrassed, with that card's low frame rate never dropping below the average for the 5300. The GTX 1050 did surprisingly okay in this title, with a frame rate that was only 20% off that of the 5300. Minecraft is one of my favorite benchmarks because realistically, a low end card like this might spend quite a few hours playing this game. And in Minecraft, the card performs spectacularly with a frame rate that would be more than adequate for a 1080p 144Hz setup. With a 190fps on average and only 142 at its worst, you don't ever have to worry about stutters or screen tearing in this game. However, when compared to the other cards, it gets absolutely humiliated, with even the GTX 1050 outperforming it. The 560 was the only card with a worse performance. Maybe it's a driver thing or something else entirely, but the Radeon cards were clearly outmatched in this title. All the benchmarks are wrapped up, but we are not done yet. Radeon drivers have come a long way in the past five years, and one of my favorite features is the one-button overclocking ability that it gives you. And with the simple click of a mouse, we were able to overclock the core from 1645 MHz to 1800 MHz, and the RAM from 1750 MHz to 1860 MHz, giving us a new memory bandwidth of 178.5 GB per second. That should get us a lot closer to the performance of an RX 5500 XT. So, let's take a look. Let's quickly go over the results. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we saw a noticeably more smooth gameplay, with the low frame rate increasing by almost 30%. The average climbed within 32% of the 1650 Super. In Overwatch, we see the 5300 climb within margin of error of only 1 FPS on the low end average of the much more powerful 1650 Super. The high frame rate even managed to surpass it. Not bad. In Star Wars Squadrons, we saw a 20% increase in performance for the average, and the 5300 climbed within 19% of the 1650 Super. In Squad, we again saw a nearly 15% increase in performance. The lows also climbed a bit, getting it further away from the 30fps screen tearing danger zone. The 5300 was still outclassed by the 1650 Super, but by not nearly as much. And finally... Minecraft. After overclocking, we unleashed an unholy demon, allowing this card to reach a mind-numbing 272 FPS average with a whopping nearly 32% uplift in performance. This puts the 5300 well past the 1650 Super and the GTX 1050 with a 7 and 9% lead respectively. Not bad for a card AMD thought so little of it couldn't be bothered to give it a retail release. So with all that wrapped up as it stands, the 1650 Super is the card to get for systems that offer a Radeon 5300. That's not really much of a surprise as the RX 5500 XT competes and in general is a little bit slower than the 1650 Super. But if you do manage to find a 5300 in the wild, it's not a bad card for the $130 price point. It's just a darn shame that AMD didn't give it a full retail release as it would trounce the regular 1650 which is on average 40% slower than the 1650 Super. 
If AMD can find it in their hearts to give it a retail release at a competitive price point, I'd certainly give it a thumbs up. But as it stands right now, the 1650 Super is the card to get. So thank you folks for watching. If you have any comments, suggestions, or tips, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I always read them. If you want to join our Discord to talk about weird and low-end tech stuff, there'll be a link in the description. As always, thank you folks for watching. May your frame rates be high and your prices low. And I'll catch you folks next time.